Okay, I just started with the introduction. So, hi, my name is Volker Simonis. I'm working for SAP in Germany, Waldorf in the SAP headquarter. I'm working on Java since many years on Hotspot, OpenJDK, SAP JVM, which is our commercial Java implementation. Uh, my newest baby, or all newest baby, is Submachine, which is an OpenJDK uh, downstream version uh, produced and maintained by SAP. This is my current work. But now my talk is more general. It's about uh, Java classes. All the slides and the examples are online on GitHub. I will show this slide at the end one more time. So there's actually no need to take notices. You can just copy the link uh, after the talk. OK, so let's get started. What, is, what are Java classes? The class file format, that's a binary file format. Uh, which can be executed by a Java Virtual Machine. It's platform independent, so every platform which has a Java Virtual Machine can execute class files. Uh, that's actually one of the main promises of Java, that it runs everywhere, so the class file format has to be uh, independent of a hardware and operating system. And it's uh, well defined uh, in chapter four of the Java Virtual Machine specification. So just a small uh, introduction in the class file format. As I told you, it's a binary format, first four Bytes are the magic uh, cafe babe hex string, which identify a Java class file. Then we have uh, the class file versions. Usually only the major version is increased with every major Java release. <coughs> then we have the constant pool, which is one of the most important parts of the class file besides the bytecodes. So the constant pool contains all the symbolic information. It's comparable to a symbol table in a classical uh, program environment. We have some flags, and then we have a pointer to uh, the class, uh, which actually defines uh, the, the actual class and the superclass. Then we have an interface count and an array of interfaces. For all the interfaces this class implements, we have a field count with all the fields, and the same with the methods. And then the, the method uh, part contains the actual, the real bytecodes, which get executed when you call a Java method. Finally, we have attributes, and there is a set of predefined attributes like, uh, for example, line number information, uh, and, but uh, a, a Java vendor or everybody is free to define its own attributes, and the Java virtual machine has to ignore attributes which, is doesn't, which it doesn't know. Okay, so let's look how this uh, uh, looks in, in reality. So we have a famous Hello World program. We simply compile it. And then with Java P, the Java disassembler, we can look at the executed class file. When we do that, we see that uh, this class, this is actually the output of Java P. So this class is uh, actually a pointer to the constant pool entry. Uh, and all the contents of the class file contain uh, references, so links to, to the constant pool. And, uh, then this constant pool entry is, is a so-called class entry, which has another pointer to a UTF-8, which to a string entry, and this string, sorry, and this string entry finally defines the name of the class, in this case, Simonis Hello World. So the class Hello World in the package Simonis. You may wonder why we have all these redirections, but that's actually a quite uh, <coughs> efficient format, because um, this way uh, the, the, the symbols can be reused and don't have to be uh, stored many times. So for example, the class name is also used for methods and for other stuff, and they all can reference the same string then. If you look further, further on, uh, we come to the, to the method part, and as I told you here, we have the, the bytecodes, and it's, uh, uh, again, for example, when we look at, at this invoke virtual call here, it only has one reference into the constant pool, and the, Reference of an invoke virtual is a so-called methods reference entry in the constant pool, and this, uh, the, con the, the, the content of this entry is two other references to a class, which again points to our to, to the class to the holder class of the method, and the the, the second entry points to a so-called name and type entry, which is again two has a, again two further links to to the final names, which are the <coughs> which are the, the name of the function, which is print line and the signature. So this is how the, cons how the class file is built up. Finally, the attributes, for example, the line number table, which is used for debugging, it tells us that in our source code line number five, 
starts at bytecode zero, uh, and line number six starts at uh, <coughs> line, uh, bytecode index eight. And then we have the local variable table. This is also used to hold the, the scope of local variables, also used for debugging. Okay, so uh, Java has different kind of classes. It's the top level classes, it's the normal classes, then we can have nested classes, and nested classes can further be divided into static nested classes, which are most of the time just called nested classes, and non-static nested classes, so-called inner classes, and inner classes have two more variations, which is local and anonymous classes. And finally, we have BM anonymous classes, which is not actually really a class type uh, defined by the Java specification, it's just an implementation detail of the hotspot virtual machine, but it's quite interesting, and we'll uh, therefore have a look at that as well. So let's start with the static nested classes. We have a top-level class, uh, which uh, declares a, <coughs> a static nested class, and then we have a main method which just uh, instantiates this class. If we compile this with Java C, C we will get uh, two class files, actually, top-level class and top-level.nested. So, uh, Probably everybody has seen that before. Um, so what, what, what has happened when we change the signature of our constructor from public to pri private? So, so uh, what do you think? When we compile this, will we get a compile error because we cannot call the constructor? Will we get uh, two class files as before? Or will we get three class files? So who is for one? Come on, wake up after uh, lunch. Who is for two classes, like before? Who is for three classes? Okay, so when we compile it with Java C, we get three classes. Uh, the two, like before, top level, top level nested, and we get this strange top level dollar one class. But wait, there is not just Java C uh, of your JDK. Eclipse, for example, has its own Java compiler. Let's see what he is doing. So if you compile this with the Java C compiler from Eclipse, we can do that either in the Eclipse IDE or from the command line by putting ECJ, jar file, into the class pass. It only compiles two classes. So this is some, seems to be some implementation detail. Let's look what the compilers produce. So on the left side, you see the Java P output from Java C generated class, and on the right side, that from ECJ. And <coughs> you can see that top level .nested class, uh, they, they, they both uh, ge generate th this class. And uh, <coughs> they, but, uh, but then the constructor lo looks different. So both have a synthetic constructor. So this means this is a constructor. Sorry, so th 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 this, this is the constructor which we've defined in, 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 the, in the source code. It takes no argument and, and is private. But then both versions have another constructor which we haven't de declared in source code. So that's why it's, it has an attribute synthetic. It was generated by the compiler as a helper method. And, and Java C uh, uh, generates this uh, synthetic constructor with, a, with an argument uh, of top level dollar $1 with just a marker class because inner classes are a concept of the Java language, not of the Java virtual machine. Java virtual machine only knows classes, top level classes. So in order for one class to access the private method of another class, that, that, that's simply not possible with, with the means of, for, of the Java virtual machine. So we need, to, to, we need a helper method with this, which is package private. So this is this synthetic constructor. And in order to prevent others from calling this, the Java C compiler uses a version which takes this uh, package private uh, generated top level dollar one class, while the ECJ compiler goes a different way, which is more elegant in my eyes. It just creates a new constructor which adds the class itself as a parameter to this package private uh, constructor. And now uh, the top level class can call this protected constructor with this synthetic argument and still instantiate this class. And you see both of the synthetic uh, constructors, they did nothing else than just calling the private one, because now we are in the class already and we can simply call uh, this constructor. 
So this was all uh, until Java 11. We had to go this way. In Java 11, a new concept was added called nest-based access control with JEP 181. And if we take the Java C compiler of Java 11, we see it only generates uh, two classes, like the ACJ compiler. But when we look at the output, we see that the top-level class itself, it simply invokes uh, the private uh, constructor of the nested class. So you may wonder why does this work now in 11 and why didn't this work before? So in 11 we have uh, this nest-based access control introduced special attributes in, in the class file and these attributes declare so-called nest members. That means nested classes to which the top level class gets access. And here we declare, the, the compiler declares that the top level class has a nest member called toplevel.nested. And when we decompile the toplevel.nested class, we see that the constructor is still private, but again, it has a new attribute called nest host, which defines its nest, nest class. So now we don't have to go this way and declare synthetic, uh, some strange synthetic constructors or also access accessors for other methods in order to allow uh, access between nested classes and their uh, 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 nest hosts, but we can do this with the, ho with the help of attributes and the virtual machine wake will make, will ensure that only the correct uh, classes which have a nest membership can access each other's members. <coughs> so let's go further to inner classes. So if it, 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 an inner class it is a non-static uh, nested class, and because this is not static, an inner class cannot live without an instance of its outer class. So that's why we have to, to use this uh, strange uh, calling convention here when we, co when we create an inner class, because we cannot simply say new inner. New inner is always needs a top level class as its class holder, because you can imagine inner as a kind of uh, capturing the closure of its external class. An inner class always has access to the fields of its outer class, and so there has to, it has to live in the context of an outer class. And again, when we disassemble this inner class, uh, we see that now the compiler has added a synthetic fields, not just synthetic methods like before, so it, the top-level inner class has um, a synthetic field called this dollar zero, and this is used to uh, hold a reference to its enclosing class. And you also see that the compiler automatically added uh, an, a, a parameter to the constructor, which we haven't done, so our, our inner class has no argument, the constructor of the inner class, but the compiler has added this, so this is, can imagine this like a kind of this pointer <coughs> in, in C++ to enable the inner class to access members uh, fields of its outer class. So I told you inner classes, there's also some um, two, two more flavors. So the one probably everybody knows, it's so-called anonymous classes. If, if, we use, if you create a runnable, for example, you say new runnable, and then just implement the run method on the fly, compile this, this will actually create a new class because this, this, but it's, this class has no name, but it's a, a new class which, which implements the runnable interface. Um, and uh, so the compiler has to create a new class for, for this construct here. And in Java, we can also create so-called local classes. It's not used so often, but in every, we can just create a class inside the method and use that in the method. And again, the compiler then creates uh, this class with the name top level one, and then the, the name of the class, because this is not anonymous, it has a name. But still, we could have uh, several methods with the same name. We could have, uh, every method could, com could have an inner class with the same name within the class, so that's why we have to also number them consequently. Okay, now let's come to VM anonymous classes, which is slightly more interesting, maybe, not so well known. So 
Java 8 introduced uh, lambdas in, in, in the language, and uh, with lambdas we can do something like here. We create a new runnable, and we don't create an anonymous inner class now, which has a runnable, which has a run method, but instead we just assign this runnable a lambda method. And this, this lambda method uh, here just creates an exception and prints a stack trace. We will see why we need this. And <coughs> excuse me. Uh, then we, we print, we, we get the class name of our runnable and print its name, and finally we run the runnable. So let's see how this looks like. We compile uh, VM anonymous. We get just one class file. Uh, when we run it, we see that the name of our runnable class is quite strange. So the name is VM anonymous dollar dollar lambda dollar one, and then a strange number. So what's this? Let's look how the, the, the whole output looks like. And we see now that um, we have here our main method, and our main method calls the lambda method. So is there something missing here? From main, we actually called run on our runnable object, which is of this type here. Uh, but strangely, we don't see this run method in the stack trace. So there is one extended option called minus xx show hidden frames. It's a diagnostic option, so we have to uh, unlock it with unlock VM diagnostic options. If you run this program with this parameter, we will see we will also see this run method here. But because this run method is part of this so-called VM anonymous class, which is just an implementation detail how Hotspot implements uh, lambdas the implementers of Hotspot decided to not show you these frames. So you actually just call Lambda for main, and they, they saw that that's enough for, for most programmers. And you also see that here, the line number information is actually unknown one million, because there is no class file for this Lambda class. It's just generated internally in the Hotspot, and obviously it has no line numbers. There is another property which can be set if you're interested how this class looks like, and that's called JDK internal lambda dump proxy classes, and it takes some pass argument uh, as option, and if you, if you run the program with this option and uh, look at, at the directory which we gave him as parameter, we will see that uh, the, the virtual machine now dumps this class which is, it generates internally to implement lambdas to the class file, and you can actually, we could, inf we could inspect that uh, with, with Java P. But now we won't do this, uh, we, but we will look at the uh, contents of the file uh, in, on the next slide. I just want to mention that Java 9 also introduced the stack walking API, which uh, gives you access to this show hidden frames parameter from, from an API uh, point of view. So if you create a stock stack walker, if you create a stack walker in our runnable and use the option show hidden frames, we can simply run this program without minus xx option and still see these hidden frames in, uh, in our stack walker. So now let's come back to our example and let us, look, let, let us have a look at the VM anonymous class which was generated by, by Hotspot so I slightly, only slightly changed my example and insert the system console read line, line here so that after the stack choice has been printed, we will just wait for an input so, in, so that we have a chance to inspect the running VM. And uh, <coughs> we run this now uh, with the hidden frames and we see all, all the frames and the generated class. And what we can do now is use the JPS tool to get the process ID of our program and then we will use the so-called serviceability agent, which is a very nice tool which allows you to inspect and query the internals of a running virtual machine. It can also be used to inspect uh, core files, so when your virtual machine crashes, you can use it to inspect this. I had another talk about hotspot crashes, which also heavily uses this tool, so if you're interested in more details, you can watch that talk on YouTube. So this, cool, this tool is called J Java Hotspot Debugger, J JHSDB, it has a command line version and a GUI version which is called HSDB and we will use this one. And when we start this tool, uh, a, a GUI will pop up 
we will just enter the process ID of our Java virtual machine which is running, press OK, and then uh, a new window will appear which will show all the Java threads which are running inside the virtual machine, and we select the main thread and then say that we want to see the stack trace of the main thread, then we get why well, the, the UI is not very fancy, uh, it's quite old, but still can be still useful. So you see here uh, again this, the, the, the stack trace, here the first method is main, and then we call run, then we call this lambda method, and this is, uh, we are then string read line, and string read line calls a lot of other stuff. So these are all links, and we can click on the run method. If we do that, we will get more information about the run method. We see its holder class is this VM anonymous dollar dollar lambda class, which is strange name. And we also see the bytecodes now of this run method. And this run method is, contains just two bytecodes, an invoke static and a return. And the invoke static actually invokes our lambda methods, which we have seen in a stack trace before. And when we click on that method, <coughs> excuse me, we will see that now this, this lambda method is part of our VM anonymous class. It's a synthetic class, which you can see here. Uh, sorry, a synthetic method. So again, this is a method generated solely by Java C, not by us. But it's actually, it actually contains the bytecodes for the code which we have written for this lambda. So you see here it loads the hello world string here. Uh, and then it invokes, uh, the invokes print stack trace. And then after print stack trace, it invokes a uh, read line on the console object. So this is actually how, how lambdas are implemented. The VM generates a synthetic so-called VM anonymous class, which we don't see at all. And this has a, a run method, which only calls then the synthetic lambda method, which contains our, the contents of our lambda method. So let's come to another topic, class identity. Uh, I have a simple uh, program here with, uh, uh, called two loaders. And uh, what I've defined here, I define a new class loader, a URL class loader. So a URL class loader loads classes from the URLs, which we give him as a parameter in the constructor. And this, uh, this line here is just a trick to get the path of our own class, which are where our own class was loaded from. So we actually create a URL class loader, which will load classes from the same class bus where our class, the two loaders class, was loaded from. And what we are doing now is, with our new class loader, we load our two loaders class again and create an instance of it. So you remember we have created a first instance of two loaders. Now we reload the two loaders class in a URL class loader and create a, a second instance of two loaders. And now we print out uh, several informations. So the first one is we get the class name of the first two loaders object and the second and compare them. So what we are saying, will these names be the same? One for yes, the same. Who is for the same? Okay, who thinks the names will be different? Okay, uh, then second, we will test if the second object, which was the second instance, which was created from the class loaded by the URL class loader is the same. So we use instance of operator to see if the same instance is the same class as the, as, as the uh, Simonis two loaders class, which we use internally. So who, who thinks that this uh, instance of call will returns true? Who thinks false? And finally, we cast TL2, the TL2 instance to TL1. So do you think this will result in a compile time error, in a runtime error, or run just fine? So who is for one? Runtime error, two, runs fine. Yeah, so let's, let's have a look. So we run it. So of course the name is true. So the, oh sorry. The names of the classes are both times the same, but uh, of course the, the instance of operator returns false because as I told, 
because class identity in Java is not defined by class name it's, or by the class itself. By class equality, it's defined by, by the class and the class loader. It's, it, it, it's a tuple. And these two classes are, are the same. They are loaded from the same class file, but by different class loaders. And by definitions, these classes are not equal. And finally, when we try to cast the one object into another object, we will got a, a class cast exception, so a runtime exception, and the uh, error message, which you can see on the command uh, on the console, is quite strange. It says something like, "Simonis two loaders cannot be cast to Simonis two loaders," which sounds like strange because it's two times the same. Uh, but not there is not just uh, the Oracle JDK. There is other Java implementations, like for example the SAP JVM I was working on, or I'm still working on. And this has, if you run the same program in this virtual machine, we get a slightly more uh, extensive uh, error message, and it says something, class Simon is two loaders, loaded by the URL class loader, cannot be cast into the class Simon is two loader, loaded by the application class loader. So it tells you there's these two classes, also they may be uh, by twice equal, they are loaded by different class loaders, and therefore are not the same. So in Java 11, Finally, we managed to integrate these changes into OpenJDK. There was a long discussion, as you can imagine, not about the feature. Everybody loved this feature, to have this more expressive class cast exception, but it was about the text. So this text was considered too verbose, which may be okay, which may be true. And finally, with Java 11 and later, you have now this uh, in OpenJDK and all the Java distributions based on OpenJDK, which says Simon is too low, the now we also get module information because Java 11, uh, but it, 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 it actually gives you an idea what, what's the problem. Okay, so now let's come to a topic called class hierarchy analysis. In Java, all methods which are not static or final are actual virtual methods and uh, as you may know, virtual methods get called through, the, through a V table, virtual function table, and this is a, a, an indirection which is usually costly to implement and which makes it actually not easy to inline virtual methods because at, 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 you can only decide at runtime which version of a method you call if there is overloaded versions of this method. So let's have a look at, uh, at this example here. It's actually, that has nothing to do with nested methods. I just used nested classes here to, to fit it on the slide. So we have uh, a, a top level class and it contains a nested class A with an empty function F. And then we have class B which extends A and overrides F, again empty. And finally we have a static, a static method G which takes a parameter of type A and calls F on A. So quite simple, right? Uh, now we have a main method, we create a new object of type A, and then in a loop uh, we call G with A as parameter. We do this 20,000 times in order to warm up the JIT compiler so that the virtual machine has a chance to compile a G, and uh, then we just create a new object of type B and we run the f exactly the same loop like before 20,000 times more. So let's see what the output is. There's a lot of parameters. The important ones are just print compilation and print inlining. The others aren't really uh, required for this example. They just make it easier to see the, the outcome on the command line. So when we run it, you see that at some point in time, uh, our method G, the testing method G, is uh, JIT compiled because the virtual machine realizes that we call it again and again, so it makes sense to compile it. And what you can see here is that F is inlined. So although F is by definition virtual, the, virtu the, the hotspot realized that, uh, or, or somehow thought it, it can inline because we only call F. Then we call, uh, then at some, some times later, the, 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 the compiled method will be de-optimized, so it, it will be made not entrant, and then it will be, it gets compiled again, and again we inline F, but now we also get some type information here. So you see type profile, 
the method f was called 11,000 times from G, and all these 11,699 times, the type of the parameter was of type A, so that why it could be inlined. So uh, let's add another parameter, uh, xlog class loading. So this is the, the logging API, which was introduced in Java 9, and it allows us to see the class loading events. So if you have both this, uh, these logs switched on, again, we see that at the beginning when we run the program, our cl uh, class A gets loaded, then we get the compilation. And then just before the, method, the, the compiled method will be uh, de-optimized, the loading of class, class B happens. So somehow magically when we, when we create, when we instantiate the first instance of B and B gets loaded by the virtual machine, the virtual machine realizes that now some of the assumption it, it, uh, it made before it compiled G the first time are now, have now been invalidated. So it invalidates uh, the compiled method and compiles it again. And to see how these dependencies are tracked, we can use uh, trace dependencies, extended command line option. The other command line option which we are using here is print comp uh, compile command to print the generated code for G, so we get an impression what happens. So running this, we see this is the first uh, compiled version of our G method. So you remember, G only called F, and F was an empty method. So it shouldn't contain a lot of code. And indeed, all it does is it creates a stack frame, and then it does a null check, because Java still, still <coughs> ensure, has to ensure that e when we call G with a, with a null object, it's, it still has to throw a, a null pointer exception. Even if the method F uh, doesn't do anything, it still needs to throw a null pointer exception if, if the argument on which we call F uh, is, is null. And this is actually here, uh, uh, the RSI register contains the first argument of the method, and this test just ensures that it's not zero. In the case it's zero, it jumps to B3, which throws the exception. I haven't shown this code here. But otherwise, it just pops the frame again and returns. So this is, this is G with F inline. So nothing happens. It's the shortest method, we, so shortest compiled method we can have in, in Java. But we see that uh, from our trace dependencies, uh, uh, trace dependencies uh, command line option, we get uh, some dependencies information which uh, uh, Hotspot has locked. Uh, and it says that there is a dependency of a unique concrete method in A. So it means that um, until now, F is a, a virtual method, but until now there is just one implementation uh, until this point in time, and this is the one from A. So this is why F can uh, easily be inlined, because there is no overloaded version until now. So later on, we load Oh, we, we load class B because we instantiate an object of it, and now every time a new class is loaded into a hotspot, it goes to the list of all recorded dependencies, and now it finds out that a dependency has been violated. So the, pen, the dependency that the method F from class A is only implemented in A has now been violated by class B, which has an overloaded version of B, and that's why it deoptimizes G and and recompiles it then a second time. But still, even the second time, it can still, uh, still inline F because it has the profiling information which tells Hotspot that although there exists object of other types which overload F, uh, or object of classes of other type which overload F, still in our case, only objects of type A have been used as parameters. But in order to make sure that nothing can happen at runtime, it introduces now a check. So it loads uh, the class information of the argument. Again, the argument, first argument is in the register RSI. And at offset eight from this argument in, in the object header, in the so-called object header, there is a pointer to the class object, to the class information. And, and this, this uh, class information is now com compared against this pointer, which is actually a pointer to the class A. 
And if this is not true, we will jump to B4, which is an uncommon trap, and then again, we will deoptimize and recompile, but until this assumption is not violated, again, we have just an empty method, uh, so inlining still works pretty well. So uh, now, uh, a short quiz question. Before we had here this B uh, equals new B, so we created a new object of type B and uh, assigned it to a field of type B. So if we change this uh, and make the, the type of the field B to be A and assign A, B, a new object of type B, do you think this will change something? Uh, what do you think? It's the same behavior as before? One, who is for one, same behavior as before? Who thinks that we, 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 uh, we don't get any inlining now? So who is for two? And who thinks that we will get no more recompilation at all, three? Yeah, it's kind of hard to see this, but let's run it. And you see what happens. We get no recompilation anymore. We get just one compilation. And if you look closely at the output, we see that actually now both classes, A and B, have been loaded uh, before the first compilation. So in order to give you a hint why this has happened, what do you think if you run the same program with the no verify flag? Same behavior as before, so just one compilation for one. Initial behavior, so uh, compilation, deoptimization, and compilation, who is for two? two. Yes, so two is the right uh, answer. So the no verify flag actually switches off the verifier. So Java Virtual Machine actually has a, a so-called verifier which ensures type safety at class loading so that type safety doesn't have to be done uh, when we, um, at, at, at runtime. So it, it can be done at class loading time and actually the verification, uh, so now we get the same behavior as before. Yes, and if you're interested in verification, there's a nice talk of Nikita Lipsky about class verification, which you can find online. And what actually happened is that when we have, when we have this line here, the verifier sees that we have a, a slot B on the stack, a local slot B, which, where we assign an instance of this class B, so there's nothing to verify. But if we have to assign a class, an instance of class B, to a slot which is of, of type A, the verifier has to ensure that B actually derives from A or extends A. And this is why already at verification time we have to load class B. So if we use this here, class B gets loaded before we even uh, enter in this loop the first time. Actually, it's already load it when we, when we load uh, class A. And that's why we get the same behavior like before. <coughs> okay, so I come to uh, next topic called class instrumentation and redefinition. Uh, you may know that uh, Java offers the possibility to uh, instrument or redefine classes. In order to do this, you have to implement the instrumentation interface. I won't go into uh, the, the, the details of this, you can look up the source code uh, online in my Git repository. Actually, uh, the, the important part is that on a class transformer, you can just call transform, give it the bytes of your class, and to get a new version of, of this class. And uh, there is a transform class, which gets called automatically when a class is loaded. And there is a retransform class which can be called through an API to retransform the classes again and again. Okay, so you can e easily in implement an instrumentation agent by packing um, this uh, su 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 such a class into a uh, into a jar file. Uh, declare a pre-main method. It's not main; it's pre-main, and when you put this instrumentation agent, like for example a debugging agent, it's also, an it's also a Java agent. If you put this agent on, on, your, on the command line, like here, Java agent, uh, it will call the pre-main method and initialize the, the instrumentation agent. 
so the thing I've done here is I implemented an instrumentation agent, uh, which actually uh, adds a transformer, and the transformer is actually just a, 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 it, it's just a function which uh, prints, uh, which changes every method in 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 a in in, the, in, a, in, a, in which changes every method such that it prints method entry and method exit uh, messages. So I won't go into the implementation. We just run this. So I have a class instrument here, which again creates a runnable, and uh, this runnable is assigned a, a lambda method like before. If you run this now with a with our instrumentation agent and the show hidden frames option like before, you see that our tra my transformation agent gets loaded and it says now it enters the main method. From the main method we call the lambda method, then we print our the exception, then we exit the lambda method and we exit the main method. So again, is there something missing here? Yes, the run method hasn't been implemented. The run method of our uh, the run method of our VM anonymous class couldn't be in, hasn't been instrumented. And this is a topic which has also been discussed extensively on the various OpenJDK mailing lists. A lot of people complain that they cannot implement these uh, methods of VM anonymous classes, but again, it was considered an implementation detail and uh, it hasn't been changed. So there is a bug for this, but it was closed, it won't fix. So you can instrument actually all the classes, but not VM anonymous classes. Uh, here is the second example, instrumentation example. It's a little more complicated, but not really. So we have an inner class A, which uh, creates a runnable, and the runnable is actually just uh, a lambda, which waits on a countdown ledge until we count it down. And in our main program, we create such a runnable, and then we have, uh, 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 we have a loop where we uh, retransform our class A uh, 10 times. And every time after we have uh, retransformed it, we call our runnable in a new thread. So we start a new thread with the runnable and, and call start on it. So if you run this with the instrumentation agent, you can see that uh, the agent gets loaded. That's the first version which, which gets executed. Uh, then we retransform uh, the, the, the class A. We enter the lambda method. We retransform, we enter the lambda method. You remember that the lambda method waits on this countdown ledge, so it, it won't exit. And we do this uh, for for ten times. Uh, so what do you think? How many versions of class A are actually now living in the in the VM? One version, several versions, or ten versions? So who is for one version? Who is for several? And who is for ten? Yeah. So if you use, we 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 could use the serviceability agent, but now we use the J command tool, which takes also takes the process ID of our Java virtual machine, and it has a, a command called GC class statistics. If you run this on our VM, you can see that I've, I've, I've cut some out to fit them on the slide, but there's actually exactly 10 versions of this, uh, of, the, of the redefined class available. And again, if you're interested in the topic of class redefinition and class reloading, uh, there was a talk by Anton Akhipov, I think he also did it here in 2017, two years ago, and JEConf, it, it, it's online. He speaks about it in more detail. What is actually hap happening is that um, when you create a new object of type A in a, in a virtual machine, you will always get the latest version, so the, 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 the last version, but the thing here was that um, we we had we, we had uh, the, 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 this lambda was still running while we were redefining the class it is implemented in. So while while this method is running, the the virtual machine cannot clean up the old version 
of the class. So it has to, to keep all these 10 versions live, alive until the last execution, until the last frame of this method uh, finished. And when we then, in a, I have a system, read, a system in read here, when and afterwards count down this countdown latch, when, when all these methods finished, the, this, this old class versions will be automatically deleted. But until there is a, a, a life, that until there is a version still running, the VM cannot obviously delete this old version. So that's why we end up with, with 10 different versions. Okay, so I think I'm running out of time. I have a, a, a graphics here which explains how the VM maintains all these data structures. If somebody is interested in this, I'm, I'm more than happy to explain this uh, afterwards somewhere in, 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 uh, outside. Uh, but uh, I think for now I, I will finish. And if there are more questions, uh, if there are some questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Yes? Uh, from the last uh, example, does, G does GC uh, cleans uh, outdated classes that already transform and not needed anymore? Yes, ah, okay. but only if there is no reference to a method of this class. So in the example, there were still uh, methods live. Uh, that, that's why they, they weren't cleaned up. Okay. So any other questions? Okay, so then I finish for now. And uh, as I told you, if you have more questions, you can catch me after the talk and I will be here at the whiskey party and tomorrow all day. So please feel free to ask. Thanks a lot for your attention. Bye.